students of Knox County Schools. I am Miss Maxie and I teach fifth grade social studies and science at Farragut Intermediate School. And I am here with you today in my full suffragist wear for another KCS at home social studies lesson. We are focusing today on the fifth grade standard 5.47 in part two of Tennessee history. Let's all say our standard together. Identify Tennessee's role in the passage of the 19th Amendment, including the impact of Ann Dallas Dudley and Harry Byrne. Now, I realize that this is a fifth grade standard, but suffrage is an important topic for all ages, and especially in the year 2020. Now, I know that we, when we think of the year 2020, we're going to always think of the unprecedented pandemic. But it is also the centennial or the 100 year celebration of women gaining the right to vote. Another fellow suffragist at my school and I had monthly tea times to discuss women's suffrage on our school news. And the information that I am teaching you now, we were unable to cover before schools closed. So I am super excited to be able to have tea with you to discuss this historical event, not just in our country's history, but also our state. If this video is hard to understand, please follow the following recommendations. I want to begin with the words of Abraham Lincoln. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now, President Lincoln gave his famous speech, the Gettysburg Address, in 1863 during the American Civil War. And when he said four score and seven years, a score is 20 years. So he was referring to 87 years prior to 1863, which takes us to, can you do some quick math, 1776. And he spoke the words from the Declaration of Independence in hopes of preserving our nation, the Union, that was split, and also by giving a sense of patriotism. I want us to go back 15 years prior to even President Lincoln's famous words to the Seneca Falls Convention. This is considered to be the very first women's rights convention in the United States. It was organized by Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott. Elizabeth Cady Stanton wrote a Declaration of Sentiments, and in it, she stated that all men and women are created equal, and that both men and women are endowed with unalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These were revolutionary words for their time. Now, you see, in 1920, which is where we are going to be in history today, was three score and 12 years from the Seneca Falls Convention. I'm gonna see if you can figure out that math problem. We're looking at 1920, where we are today, and we're going back to 1848, and that's three score and 12 years. But unfortunately, during that time period, men and women were still not equal, even in 1920. Even though women were citizens of the United States, they did not have the right to vote. Now, I know that you have already studied in fifth grade the passage of the 19th Amendment, the first semester in social studies, when you studied U.S. history. But today, we are going to learn about the very important and dramatic role that Tennessee played 
in women gaining the right to vote. Let's go over some important vocabulary before we begin so that we have a word knowledge so that we can fully understand our standard. The United States Constitution is what we call a living document because it was created with the purpose of being able to grow and to change. Why? The framers allowed this in Article 5 so that the changes or amendments could be added so that this document, the Constitution, could endure for ages to come. Nevertheless, the amendment process isn't quick nor easy, and it is done in what we call our legislative branch of government, or Congress. Now, we know that there are three branches of government. The executive branch, which is our president on the national level, or a governor on our state level. There is the judicial branch, which are the courts. And then, as we're discussing now, the legislative branch. Now, it's made up of two parts. We call that bicameral. Bi means two. Bicycle has two wheels. That is the House of Representatives and the Senate. That is definitely on our national level. And for the majority of the states, they also have a bicameral legislature. If they don't, it would be called unicameral, meaning only one. Like a unicycle has one wheel. Amendments can be proposed in two ways. Two-thirds of both houses of Congress can propose an amendment or two-thirds of a state legislature can ask Congress to call a national convention to propose an amendment. Now let's think about math and fractions. Three-thirds would be a whole, so two-thirds is almost a whole, so that would be a majority. Now we are going to also learn that President Wilson asked Tennessee Governor Albert Roberts to hold a special assembly and vote on the 19th Amendment. Now, once an amendment is passed, it must be ratified, or we call that a ratification process. That's where you officially approve a written document. That requires three-fourths of the states to vote in favor of that proposed amendment. Again, four-fourths of a whole is the whole, Three-fourths is almost, so that is also a majority. Now, does anyone want to guess how many times our Constitution has been amended? I'll give you a moment. It's 27. Okay, so the struggle for women gaining the right to vote is what we call suffrage. It was a long and arduous road. Remember three score and 12 years worth? That is 72 years. So it was 72 years from the first Women's Rights Convention, the Seneca Falls Convention in 1848 to 1920. Wow. And it all started with a conversation over tea. Now, suffrage does not mean suffering. Even though women's rights were definitely suffering, it simply means the right to vote. And for us today, we are talking about women's suffrage. In 1878, Susan B. Anthony proposed a women's suffrage amendment, but it was defeated on the Senate floor in 1887. As she stated, it is we, the people, not we, the white male citizens, nor yet we, the male citizens, but we, the whole people who formed the union. And I love this quote on the slide from this pioneer in women's suffrage. The true republic, men and their rights, nothing more. Women and their rights and nothing less. There were two groups that really struggled for women gaining those voting rights. There was the National Women's Suffrage Association and the American Women's Suffrage Association. So in 1890, they merged to form the National American Women's Suffrage Association. 
Their third president was a lady by the name of Carrie Chapman Catt. And her vice president was the Tennessean Ann Dallas Dudley. Remember hearing that name from our standard? They devised what was called a winning plan. Since women's right to vote was defeated on the federal or national level, remember with Susan B. Anthony trying to propose that in 1878, suffragists moved to fight for women's suffrage on the state level. They did this many ways. They would hold parades. They would hold marches. They picketed. They public spoke, they did public speaking engagements, and they even published articles. Now, there were several states and territories at this time that really did allow for women's suffrage, but there was no law in our Constitution that allowed women to vote on the national level. Well, with any good story or plot, there is always the antagonist. And there is, of course, one in our story today, too. There were those, unfortunately, who opposed both men and women, women suffragists. Suffrage. These were called anti-suffragists. Anti means against. Josephine Pearson, there's an image of her, really was fighting for anti-suffragist movement in Tennessee. And there were many political cartoons out at the time to promote women not gaining the right to vote. As you can see in this first image, it displayed what a woman's mind should be thinking of. Fashion, dressing, dating, getting married, writing letters, having children, and eating chocolates. A lot of the political cartoons often referred to women or made them appear like they were overbearing. They were anti-feminine spinsters who didn't care for their home or their family if they gained the right to vote. But our Tennessean Ann Dallas Dudley stated that this is a government of, by, and for the people and it's only the law that denies that women are people. Even President Lincoln said at the end of the Gettysburg Address that this government of, by, and for the people shall not perish from the earth. And suffragists were tired of women's rights perishing. So to counteract those negative images the anti-suffragists were promoting, Ann Dallas Dudley posed in this picture with her children to so show that suffragists could be feminine. They could care for their home and their children and still have the right to vote because it was, as she said, just a matter of simple justice. She was a well-educated, elegant lady, also a very dynamic speaker as well as a wife and a mother. There is a statue in downtown Knoxville in Market Square that is dedicated to the women's suffrage movement in Tennessee. And there are three ladies there that each represent the three grand divisions of our state. One is Elizabeth Avery Merriweather of Memphis, representing West Tennessee, who dared to vote in the 1876 presidential election after hearing of Susan B. Anthony's attempt in 1872. There is an image of a parade, a suffragist parade in Memphis. Anne Dallas Dudley is also another lady in the monument, and she is from Nashville, and she represents, of course, Middle Tennessee. She was the first president of the Nashville Equal Suffrage League, served as president of the Tennessee Equal Suffrage Association Incorporated, as well as the vice president with Cher Carrie Chapman Catt. And she was also the first woman in Tennessee to deliver an open-air speech after leading the first suffrage parade in the South from downtown Nashville to Centennial Park, where she is also featured in this Tennessee Woman's Suffrage Monument. 
Her vision was for men to not only fight for women, but for them to fight for the rights of women. There is an image of a suffrage parade in Nashville that I was speaking of. Oh, representing our area of Tennessee, East Tennessee, is Lizzie Crozier French. She founded the Knoxville Equal Suffrage Association and served also as the president of the Tennessee Equal Suffrage Association, Association Incorporated and was state chairman of the National Women's Party, which we'll discuss in just a moment. She dedicated her life to helping and educating women and families. In fact, there is going to be an interpretive marker placed in the Old Gray Cemetery in downtown Knoxville in her honor. The National Women's Party I was speaking of had a little more aggressive of an approach to promoting women's suffrage in the U.S. And they actually used tactics from the suffragettes of Great Britain. Women like Alice Paul and Lucy Byrne picketed in front of the White House to urge President Wilson to support a federal woman suffrage amendment. Some of these women were actually arrested and placed in jail. After World War II, excuse me, World War I, the Senate finally passed the 19th Amendment, but now that ratification process must begin. Now remember, we said that three-fourths of the state legislatures must ratify or agree to officially the 19th Amendment. This meant that 36 states out of the 48 at the time, because Alaska and Hawaii were not yet states, must vote in favor of women's suffrage. Now, this is where the plot thickens. The Tennessee governor, Albert Roberts, received many letters and telegrams asking him to support voting on this 19th Amendment. But it wasn't until he received the telegram from President Woodrow Wilson urging him earnestly to call the General Assembly into session and to vote on the 19th Amendment. You see, the Tennessee legislature was not in session so that meant that he would have had to have called a special session. But when the president asks you to do something, I'm sure he felt he had little choice. All the major leaders from the pro-suffragists to the anti-suffragists descended upon Nashville. Now we know that Uncle Sam is the image, kind of a cartoon image for the United States. Well, in Tennessee, that image was called Colonel Tennessee. Now, these are two political cartoons of the time. If you'll see the first one, the title is called Please. It is a suffragist speaking with Colonel Tennessee, who is holding the special session in his hand. And the second one, if you notice, Colonel Tennessee is sitting in between an anti-suffragist and a suffragist with the Tennessee legislature written on his hat on the floor and a sign with the special session in the background. So far, 35 out of those 48 states in 1920 had ratified the 19th Amendment. So all eyes were on Tennessee. They needed one more state to ratify it. The antis, or the antis, those against the passage of the 19th Amendment, came to Nashville wearing their red roses. Those in favor, or pro-suffragists, wore yellow roses. It became a war of the roses. Now, yellow and purple had long been the colors of suffrage, as you can see in this suffrage victory banner behind me. 35 stars had been sewn on. All they needed was one more. Well, those in Nashville were definitely showing their colors. In the Tennessee Senate, it was actually an easy victory but it still needed to pass, remember, bicameral legislature, 
in the House of Representatives. The men sitting in the House of Representatives on August 18, 1920, a roll call began. Started with two votes in favor, aye, aye. Four votes against, nay, 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 nay. Then a seventh name was called. It was a 24-year-old from McMinn County or Nyota, Tennessee. He was listed as being undecided, but had voted with the aunties against, and he was wearing a red rose. But there was a letter that he held in his jacket pocket close to his heart, a letter from his mother. I want to show you this short video clip. Congress doesn't make it a law. 36 states have to agree. Then they put it in the Constitution. We need one more state. Hold still, Francis. I want a red rose. No, you don't. Red is what the anti-suffragists wear. We don't need any more stars. I can cut as many as I want. Miss Paul said I could. What? I, I can't hear. They're going in now. Bruja says we're short one vote. We had Turner last night. This morning he was wearing red. Mr. Wells. Nay. Mr. Grayson. Aye. Mr. Fleming. Nay. Telegram, sir. It's from your mother. Mr. Turner. Nay. I bet you are curious about what that letter said. Well, I'm going to paraphrase. It said, Dear son, hurrah and vote for suffrage and don't keep them in doubt. I noticed Chandler's speech and it was very bitter. I've been waiting to see how you stood, but have not seen anything yet. Don't forget to be a good boy and help Mrs. Cat with her rats. Is she the one that put rat in ratification? Ha. Huh. No more for Mama at this time. With lots of love, Mama. What do you think Harry Byrne will do? Let's watch. Yes, young Harry Byrne listened to the words of his mother, cast the key ballot, and broke the tie in favor of suffrage. And now Tennessee became the 36th and final state needed to ratify the 19th Amendment. This amendment actually had the same words as the original amendment that Susan B. Anthony had proposed that had not passed 41 years before. 
Now, 27 million women in the United States gained the right to vote. It is said that Harry Byrne stated that he went through his whole life with this weird feeling knowing that he did the most important thing you would likely do when he was only 24 and that that most important act was in his past. Well, aren't we glad that he made that decision to listen to the advice of his mother and give Tennessee the title of the perfect 36. Now, Alice Paul could sew on that last star added to the suffrage victory banner. There is another women's suffrage monument in downtown Knoxville that honors Harry Byrne and his mother, Feb, whose advice gave him the courage to vote I for suffrage. Now, your task is to read two pages from your Gallopate textbook and do the activities that are in there. Also, I have both pro and anti suffrage quotes and political cartoons. Now, it's going to be your job to decide whether or not that vote is an I or it is for suffrage or it is nay and it is against. Be sure and give reasons and clues from the text or the image to support your answer. Now, there is also a passage from the Tennessee Blue Book, A History of Tennessee, to read, and it has also multiple choice as well as discussion questions. Don't forget to answer those questions in complete sentences and use text evidence to support your answers. Now, I have also included links to some videos and some fun songs for you to hear about suffrage. The first one is a brain pop called Women's Suffrage. The second one is a Mr. Betts video entitled The Suffragist Song. It's a parody from Bruno Mars' finesse song. There is also a link to Bad Romance Women's Suffrage inspired by Alice Paul that takes Lady Gaga's Bad Romance and puts it to a suffrage story. And then there is a segment of from the most perfect album, 27, 27 because there's 27 amendments. And this one, Dolly Parton, has her own rendition of the 19th Amendment and puts it to song. I am going to end our lesson today with a song sung and written by Candace Corrigan that aligns with our standard concerning the letter that Feb Byrne sent to her son Harry that in turn made Tennessee the perfect 36 and gave women in the United States the right to vote. <laughs> Yes. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, oh, oh.